morning to all of you. Okay, here we are. Thanks for uh, joining us today for the session. Let's get started. I'm sure most of you have uh, business critical enterprise applications in your uh, IT environment, and you are looking to evaluate migration and modernization of these legacy applications meet your uh, business and IT needs. <clears throat> I'm Anil, and I am part of the ERP migrations organization at AWS. Today, I'm here to facilitate uh, a conversation and sharing of a couple of our customers' Oracle applications modernization journey. First, we have uh, Mark from EDF sharing the Oracle Utility Applications Migration and Modernization Journey. And later on, we have Michael and George from WorldConnect sharing their e-business suite migrations journey. At the end, we'll, we'll want to hear from you, and we'll take questions as part of the Q&A session. So welcome, welcome, Mark. Over to you. Thank you, Neil, for that introduction, and good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a privilege to be here talking to you about EDF in the UK's modernization journey. Um, as Neil said, I'm Mark, and uh, hopefully over the next few minutes together, I get to share some of our insights and key takeaways so that you can take those back to your context and your own Oracle workload for consideration. So I'm just going to share a little bit about our UK uh, business context talk about what drove us to our application modernization around the Oracle critical workloads, and share some of those insights and architecture considerations along the way. And at the end, I'll share some of the things we were able to achieve and some of the key outcomes that we were able to underpin, and, and maybe talk through some of the questions and, and thoughts you guys are working through on your use cases. So EDF in the UK, we're a utilities business, uh, we provide, we supply energy and energy services to UK households and large business organisations as well. But we also generate power through some traditional um, power stations, but also through renewable sources, our nuclear power fleet, coupled with onshore and offshore wind farms. And at the centre of our strategy is about helping Great Britain achieve net zero. Sustainable solutions, for our customers, responsible decisions as a business are at the core of what we do as a business. And our modernization of our IT landscape is no different to that. In fact, that's been at the core of our IT strategy across all of our business domains. Now, our use case, our old commission workload, centers around a particular part of our supply business. And that's around our ability to provide energy services and power to the UK business sector. We're one of the largest providers of energy in the UK, and the market we operate in is highly volatile, very competitive, just like many other sectors, of course, and highly regulated. And our technology landscape needs to be able to support that diverse, ever-changing environment. And within this supply part of our business, we placed AWS at the center of our IT modernization in the cloud platform of choice. More on that in a moment. This marketplace required us to find that unique balance of performance, scalability, and sustainable compute, but also with the functional richness and the functional capability to differentiate ourselves from our competitors and meet niche customer needs. And therefore, our IT tooling and the decisions we took around this modernization were absolutely key. And so let's step into this use case. Our Oracle mission critical workload centered around two Oracle utilities applications. We called our initiative the Future IT Program. And at the center of those um, initiatives were four fundamental imperatives that needed to be true for us at the end. Firstly, we wanted that modern technical platform that would no longer constrain our business and our future growth. Secondly, we wanted to consolidate the application footprint that we had around the Oracle applications. 
But we also wanted to keep that differentiating capability that was able to keep us ahead of our market competitors. And of course, to do that, you don't just make that happen. You'll all be aware of the need to move your business, move your data, and undertake a significant migration whenever you undertake this sort of modernization. And so those four key outcomes underpinned our move towards a technical platform that no longer constrained our business, but actually set us up for the future growth and put us in a modern, ready state. And perhaps unusually, before I get into some of the technology aspects, I'm just going to share some of our key insights and takeaways so you can have these in your mind as I talk through the next bit of content. We'll talk about strategy and what good looks like for your business needs. Our team, augmenting our internal capabilities with partners from around the AWS ecosystem with the likes of TCS and Navisite proved critical in our success. Support and leadership and alignment on the business outcomes you're trying to achieve were definitely key themes that we learned along the way. And as you're undertaking these choices and moving your workloads to a, in our case, AWS or any other cloud for that matter, making the most and maximizing those architectural choices at the point you're taking that intervention. And so let's just dive into the content of the, the architecture itself. And I'll start with the application context. We were moving from an on-premise implementation, perhaps with quite a traditional implementation of um, our application sat on AIX in a constrained on-premise data center. Our Oracle databases were running on an Exadata appliance. And we had the same old story of lack of investment and nurturing those assets over time. Upgrades were needed and the compute capability within our own data center was finite and running out of space. And we could not support the future growth of our business solutions um, operations. And so as well as moving to a, a more modernized platform, and in our case, AWS, we also wanted to consolidate the application footprint in doing so. We had two legacy applications running, both from Oracle Utilities, now Power and Water, and that was customer care and billing and metadata management. And we took the opportunity to consolidate those two workloads onto one single holistic capability, Oracle Cache to Meter. But that wasn't the only thing we wanted to achieve. We wanted to leverage some of the good practices around continuous integration and continuous deployment around the application suite as well. And, and many of you that understand Oracle will know there's some considerations and some nuances, shall we say, that we need to take into account. But through the use of that partner ecosystem and the experience and expertise of those partners, and coupled with utilizing tooling around AWS Lambda, AWS Code Deploy, GitHub, and just making good use of creating master AMIs of our application, we were able to put a significant amount of automation around the application footprint. In addition to that, we just took on good practice when moving to AWS from a compute perspective. And we deployed our applications on EC2s across multiple availability zones. For our particular workload, we didn't have the need to go multi-region. That just wasn't a use case we needed to worry about. But with over 400 users across this workload, across the globe, and over four billion pounds worth of revenue going through this application, we really needed to make sure we were able to achieve scalability and performance throughout its life cycle. And then finally, around the application automation, we, we knew we had to take a load of regression testing uh, into the initiative. That consolidation of functionality meant that we would have to prove to ourselves it still worked at the other end, right? So in doing so, we undertook that testing, but also created an automated regression test suite for the core elements of that workload at an end. And we use that today when we come on to patching and upgrading, something I'll talk about in a moment. And then for us, this was, this was the key topic, the database. As I mentioned, we were running on Exadata on premise. And we really wanted to follow our IT strategy towards AWS. But we didn't want to just do that on instinct. We didn't want to do that just because our strategy said so. We needed to make sure it worked. We needed to make sure it was performant. And so to do that, we undertook a 
couple of proof of concepts. And depending on how these went, would have demonstrably informed which cloud platform of choice we went to. It was that key to us. And our proof of concept centered on two deployments of the database, Oracle on EC2 and Oracle on RDS. Strategically, we had a desire to leverage the shared responsibility model that AWS offers with its platform services. But we didn't know if we could get there, hence the two proof of concepts. And the benchmark we set ourselves was, could we mimic and match the on-premise exadata performance we saw in our production workloads? And working with our partners at AWS and at Navisite, we took production workloads, mimicked them onto our two deployments and ran them through. And, and that provided us with the evidence and the understanding that, in fact, on either deployment, we could absolutely match the performance we were needing and seeing in our existing production context. But on the RDS deployment, we were able to take those advantages of offsetting some of the core database activity around patching and real database hygiene activity, offset that, give that to AWS's platform services, and we could use our resources to focus on business context and value adding activities around the application. So through those proof of concepts, we proved to ourselves and to our stakeholders that indeed a deployment onto AWS RDS was our way forward. And so then we set about understanding what's the nature of that deployment, the size, the scale, and how are we going to move the data from A to B? And with Navisite's help, you know, experts in moving Oracle workloads to, to public cloud, we were able to leverage schema conversion tool and AWS database migration services to really inform our migration suite and the build of moving that data. So now we've got our application blueprint understood and we've made our target database choice. And so then it comes down to that simple matter of switching your business over. That's the easy part, right? Well, obviously not. But because we're running on premise and we had the option of building our new target architecture offline from that activity, we had the unique uh, option of running a single transition, a single cutover. And that played really nicely into our business needs of how we kept minimal business operational disruption through this transition and kept it seamless from our customers. These customers are strategic to us. They're very important. The market's competitive. The last thing we wanted to do in our modernization was to upset them and provide poor customer experience. So taking that single transition approach really sounded good to us. And so to do that, what we did was we decoupled our historical data migration from the live operation. And we did that incrementally over a period of time. Our cutover was incremental and allowed us to build confidence as we went. To give you some context, the, the workload and the database size was around about 15 terabytes of historical data that we needed to take across. And in our context, that amounted to about 9 billion data records. So moving that incrementally and building confidence through audit and reconciliation as we went, really instilled confidence throughout the cutover period. And then that left us with the opportunity to just focus our actual cutover, which amounted to less than an operational day on those broader landscape considerations. This workload integrated and cooperated with over 15 upstream and downstream systems. And those integrations needed to stay um, up and running with integrity throughout the cutover. And then the last bit of our cutover activity was to take that last little bit of data migration from the last operational day, transfer that through DMS, do the necessary audit and reconciliations, and prove to ourselves that the data had landed well. And across those 9 billion data records, we were able to reconcile to 99% data accuracy across them all. That, for an EDF in a UK context, is unheard of, and we were really pleased with that outcome. And so decoupling those migrations and then bringing the operation live over one cutover event enabled our stakeholders to make a really key business decision, decisive decision to switch over, really quite easy. The confidence had been built as we went, 
and we've proven that this data not only had been moved, but it had integrity and it was accurate. So what did we actually achieve in our move to AWS? Well, we had that scaled modern platform. That was one of the key imperatives I mentioned earlier. Our technology has auto-scaling in place. We're able to take advantage of platform services around our database. It's basically a modern tech platform that no longer constrains our business operations. From a cost perspective, and our, and during our on-premise implementation, we only had part of the story around our costs of our workloads. We could understand our application licensing and our application costs, but the on-premise data center charges, network charges and the likes were smeared across our whole landscape and we could not make informed decisions. So instead, when we moved to AWS, we were able to achieve full transparency across the stack at the application level, at the database level, and at the compute level. And in turn, that gave us really informed data to make decisions around our buying options. That was a game changer for us. And I'll come on to some of the ways we went about that in a moment. That functional differentiation that I mentioned, we were able to retain that despite consolidating down to one single application workload. And C2M gave us that opportunity to improve user experience. They only had one place they did their work. Data wasn't transferring between two data schemas. And fundamentally, we were able to get closer to the roadmap of Oracle's product and be able to be getting back to a good supportable position. But we were able to stay competitive. We were able to keep that functional differentiation um, in our footprint, but also do it at scale and in a performant manner. And so I stand here today where we've been able to achieve our key outcomes, where we've been able to get to set up a platform that enables the continued growth of our business operations. And the architecture is already supporting new value streams since we implemented. We've re-entered the UK gas market for business, and we're in the process of devising and designing our propositions around smart metering and half hourly time of use products to our large business customers. And this workload, this architecture, will be at the forefront of supporting that. So just reflecting back on those learnings and takeaways, those themes I mentioned earlier, have that clear strategy in mind. Be bullish about what good looks like for your transition. We were, and it stood us in great stead when the challenges came and we had to make decisive decisions. Our team was the magic, in my opinion. It was that team that made this possible. The technology helps, but if you haven't got the right experience, the right expertise, and the right blend of, of understanding what we're trying to achieve as a client, it becomes very difficult. And with the help of AWS, both in terms of their product teams, but also their event management during cutover, with TCS and Oracle themselves around the application elements, and then Navisite around how we went about our data migration and really optimizing that database RDS implementation for us, we were able to augment that with a brilliant internal IT team that really understood the business context and really understood what the, the application workload needed to achieve. And we were very fortunate. We had a really clear vision and we had good alignment between our business decision makers and our technological leaders. And throughout this transition, when things started to get a little challenging or we had to make and pivot from decisions we'd previously taken, that alignment stood us in great stead to make bold decisions and make them quickly. And as you're going through any modernization, my personal biggest learning during this transition was maximize that opportunity. You're choosing to make an intervention, to invest, to take your architecture forward. And in doing so, don't just think about what that workload needs to do for you today. Try and consider where the business is going, what the context might be tomorrow. And if you can take some bold choices during that architecture design, I would encourage you to do so. We certainly did. And those choices we made around the database implementation around RDS and the automation we were able to achieve around the Oracle application itself has stood us in a really strong position for the future.
And I'll just leave you with a few thoughts. Some of you might be sat here today thinking about your Oracle workload and the considerations that you're hearing or walking up to around, is it possible, how does that work? And we've been through this, and I just wanted to share some of our experiences around some of those key questions. So we heard you can't possibly run Oracle applications on AWS. Well, I hope in talking to you today, I've been able to prove that's not the case. Whether that's on EC2 or in containers, you can successfully run your Oracle workloads on an AWS footing. And then we heard, well, you're not possibly going to get the same performance that you can get from your Exadata appliance that sits on your on-premise implementation. And that was a big one for us, I'm not going to lie. I mentioned earlier that that database choice really was key to our, to our thinking. And, and utilizing proof of concepts and really understanding your workload how it works today, what, what good performance, what good throughput looks like, and then challenging the, the AWS and partner ecosystem to help you understand how that could work. I'd really encourage you to take that foot in should you wish to. And then, okay, Mark, so you've got your application there and you've got your database choice made, but it's gonna be super expensive. You're gonna to have to throw money at this, right, to make it work. And, and that's just not been our experience. Granted, we had to make some purchasing choices as we went, but we did that in a completely transparent manner. For the first time, we were able to see the whole stack and how the architecture was behaving with the operational transactions going through it and those key business events that were taking place. And we actually chose to not take those decisions up front. We ran the architecture for a good business quarter, really understanding how the architecture was behaving and optimizing it as we went and off the back of that, we were able to take super informed purchasing decisions with AWS. And there's a few options there, right? Whether that be reserved instances, savings plans, or even spot pricing on some components. We were able to blend that to optimize our, our TCO and our run. And then you'll hear, well, you're not possibly going to be supported on AWS by Oracle. And again, that, that's not our experience. Granted, it's unlikely that Oracle are going to accredit any workload that doesn't run on OCI. But for us, the support of the application, the support of the product was paramount for us. And the accreditation meant less to us. That was our use case. That was our story. Maybe your workload means different things. So you need to step up to that, that decision, admittedly, each time. But supportability is there today. We stay on either the latest version of the product or minus one within our support agreement and all parties are supportive, happy and working in partnership today. And then off the back of that, you hear upgrades won't be possible. Well, by very definition, I've just said that we have to stay on the right patch versions, proves that we have a way of patching, upgrading our Oracle C2M instance. And we do that utilizing some of those choices we made right up front in the architecture design around application automation, particularly around that regression testing pack. During our transition, we actually did two or three patches and upgrades on the C2M product. And then since then, since we've been in a live environment, we've undertaken many more. So I just want to close there and say thank you for your time and giving me the possibility of sharing EDF in the UK story and how we moved Oracle um, applications to AWS successfully. Thank you for listening. There will be questions available later on in the session. But for now, I would have the pleasure of handing you over to Michael and Jorge from World Connect, who are going to tell you their story. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, I'm excited to take you through WorldConnect's modernization journey and cloud migration, specifically talking mostly about our Oracle applications. So my name is Michael, and with me here is Jorge. We work at WorldConnect. 
Um, who is WellConnect? WellConnect is a global energy management company providing a diverse set of energy solutions. So if we look at some of the numbers, we have about 165,000 customers globally. We've been in the market 39 years, headquartered in sunny Miami, Florida, and uh, we're number 70 on the Fortune 100. Some of the, the details about the products and services we provide is we're in roughly 200 countries globally, about 8,000 locations, 50 different energy products. And you can see across the market, we provide a broad set of services across both traditional and sustainability energy solutions. Let's talk about our cloud migration. So ultimately, WellConnect wanted to innovate and deliver features faster and to digitize our global business operations. But I mean, that, that's a lot of words. Where were we five years ago? Well, we had 22 data centers globally. We're a company that grew largely through mergers and acquisitions, and we had a lot of operational and reliability challenges across these services. So we had to make a decision about how to solve that problem, and we decided that Amazon was the right partner to work with to be able to modernize those applications. So we started on an aggressive migration out of our on-premise data centers and to move into AWS. We built a world-class environment to be able to operate and run those applications inside AWS, and that put us in a really good position to be able to innovate, so deliver better customer service um, and self-service for our customers across the world. If we narrow down that, that problem statement, where we sat at the beginning of this specific part of that migration journey was we'd already closed 20 of those 22 data centers, and we now have the final two to work on. Those two data centers included a lot of our Oracle workloads, including EBS. Our key part of solving this problem was to improve the resiliency and the automation in these Oracle workloads. And while doing that, we needed to ensure that we were minimizing impact on our business. Oracle EBS is the heart of our business. If EBS isn't working, our business isn't working. So this was really important to us as part of solving this problem. So let's talk about current state. What sort of, uh, what was the, the size of the problem that we needed to solve? Well, if you look at current state, we had a lot of EBS and custom applications under the covers, including other Oracle services like SOAR and MDM. So they were all running on Oracle Fusion middleware. We had an old version of EBS, so we were running 11i, and we needed to move that across to 12.2. Uh, all of this infrastructure was running on Spark Solaris, and we needed to get that across to x86 in Linux so we could move it up into AWS. And we were running an old version of the Oracle database. We were running 11G, and 11G needed to get up to 19C. So you can see for us, this is not just about moving into AWS. This is also addressing a lot of legacy sitting in our environment. So the key challenges we needed to solve to be successful was downtime. If you start adding up all of these problems, including an upgrade of the database, an upgrade of the EBS platform, migrating that data into AWS, you can quickly see that we're talking 100 plus hours end to end to complete that activity. That wasn't gonna be acceptable to our business, so we had to put our thinking caps on. The second problem to solve was all around operational excellence. You'll see a theme in these presentations that these applications are the hearts of our organizations. So, we needed to make sure that we were building an operational platform that we were proud on and that we could scale our business globally on top of. Another key theme across both presentations was performance. We're a low margin business. If our financial system is not performing, our business is not performing. We need to ensure that we are very confident about the performance of our platform. Lastly was scale. We didn't have a lot of time to complete all of this work, so we needed to figure out how do I bring together all the right people to be able to get the work done. So overall, we broke this into a three-phase initiative. Right at the start, it became very obvious to us we were not going to do this as a big bang. So there was two initial phases that we worked on. Phase one, which I'm going to make sound very easy, was an uplift of the database onto x86 and Linux hardware. So get rid of the Solaris, get rid of the Spark equipment, and move on to something a bit more modern. Phase two then did a lot of the upgrade activities. This was, to be honest, the biggest of the three phases. So we got up to version 12, we got up to 19C of the database, and this put us in a really confident position to be able to complete the migration into AWS. And later on, Jorge is gonna be talking through a lot about what that AWS design looked like. So three solutions in mind, mainly talking about phase three. So why for us did we pick Amazon? Well, the first reason was partnership. 
When we look at the market, we look to choose partners who we aspire to be more like. Amazon for us is that partner. And on top of that, we've been working with them over the last uh, multiple years to complete the exit of those other 20 data centers. So we already had a proven delivery record uh, and excellence in getting to that point. Our business had a lot of confidence in our ability to be able to migrate to AWS. The next reason was cost. And similar to what Mark talked through was that uh, through some different commercial constructs, working with your Amazon account team, it is absolutely possible to be cost effective running Oracle workloads on AWS. So we got the partner that we wanted at the cost that we wanted to pay, which then led to the innovation. So this is where we wanted to have a platform that we could build digital solutions, be able to take a lot of these custom applications that we built around Oracle and modernize them on top of AWS. So the last thing I wanted to talk through before I hand over to Jorge is just around the scaling with partners. So at the beginning of our cloud migration, we made a key decision that we wanted to keep well connect at the core of our cloud migration. This is part of the reason we chose Amazon, because we knew they wanted to invest in our staff and teach them the tools and techniques to be able to run workloads on Amazon effectively. So with WellConnect running the cloud migration, we looked to a multi-partner model to bring in partners who had the specific skills and capabilities that we needed to be able to complete the three phases of this migration. So we looked to Sutherland for their experience with um, uplifting and addressing a lot of the customizations in our environment. In the early days, we even brought in Oracle to be able to help with the core database and EBS upgrade. And we also brought in AWS to be able to help automate more of the configuration in our Amazon environment. So this gives you some ideas about our cloud migration context, the specific problem we were solving around getting Oracle into AWS. I'd like to now hand it over to Jorge to talk you through some more technical details about what this migration and platform looked like in AWS. Thanks, Jorge. Thank you, Mike. So let's talk about the solution that we implemented. So as you see here, this is our final uh, implementation in AWS after phase three. So we went with one single region, two ACs. We deployed our EC2s for the application tier in two different ACs for maximum reliability. We deploy our database in two ACs. We have the database, the primary database in one AC, and we have two standby databases in Two different, in a different AC. We use Oracle Data Guard for that. So the way that we transition our on-prem database to AWS was from on-prem, we create an standby database in AWS. So when we did the transition, it was a simple switch over from on-prem to AWS. So what you see here are the services that we use for that. So we use CloudFormation to deploy our EC2s in AWS and to introduce automation in that process. So this is a regular uh, EBS implementation. We're using a shared mount point, which is an Amazon EFS that is used for the custom top and the shared Apple top between the application tier nodes. One of the things that we introduced with this is we follow best practices from Oracle. <coughs> and for that, we use something called virtual, uh, I'm sorry, logical host names, which does allow us to handle the application in a better way when we need to switch over from the primary to the standby database. I don't know if you are familiar, but when you use an EBS environment and you switch your database to a different server, you need to run out the config. When you use virtual host names, you fix that problem. So as part of the automation that we introduced here, the other part was the backups. So we went with a mixed solution. We're using Oracle, Arman for backups, but those backups are being uh, safe in an S3 bucket. Okay. So let's talk about the automation that we implemented. So part of the task that we do as DBAs, we need to guarantee that the database is up and running most of the time. For that, we use standby databases. And one of the process to move your primary to your standby database is called failover or switchover. So what we did is automation basically is taking your manual steps and make those automatic. For those, we use native AWS services. So what you see here are the uh, steps that we did and the services that we use 
for those steps. So let's say that you need to do a switch over of your database. The first thing that you need to identify is where is your standby running, and if that standby is healthy to do the switch over. Once you identify that, you shoot down your application tier. Once the application tier is down, you switch over your database to the standby database. Once that standby database becomes your primary, you bring up your application tier. So the advantage of using virtual, I'm sorry, logical host names is that you don't need to run the config at this point. So when you finish the switch over, your standby is now your primary, and your primary is your standby. Those two databases switch roles. So you are protected in case that you need to switch back. And you can do this all automatic. So we went with something that is called state machines and Lambda functions using step functions. So basically, there is a state machine that orchestrates all this process, all this flow, and receives an, as an input a JSON file that has the information of your primary, your standby, and the application tier nodes in your environment. So it will know which database needs to switch to, it will know which server needs to shut down, and which server needs to bring up after the switch over is completed. So at the end, there is one step that needs to be done, and is to change the ALB to point to the new database. So since all the nodes in the application tier are using logical host names, they know how to find the database. But any connection that is coming from outside is pointing to ALB. And at that point, you need to switch your standby to be the primary and switch that DNS for that database. So that was one of the automations that we introduced. The second automation that we introduced is when we were on-prem, one of the requirements for us is to clone our environments. So on-prem, we rely on the storage that we were using to clone our environment. And that cloning, one of the requirements is that needed to be done in three hours or less. So what we did here was to mimic the same process that we had on-prem in AWS. But in AWS, <coughs> we don't have the same storage. So we can't rely on the storage to do what we were doing on-prem. Because on-prem, we, we use the SAM, we did a snapshot of the database, and we present that snapshot to a different server, and at that point, you have your database clone. In AWS, we don't have the storage the same way that we have on-prem. So the way that we did our deployment our environments were deployed in different accounts. So we have one account for production, one account for development, one account for test. We isolate those accounts so they don't talk to each other, but we needed to clone it from production to those lower environments. So how we do that? We use kind of a man in the middle. So there is a special account that we have for that, that we use. That account is able to talk to the production account and talk to the target account. So that way we're doing the cloning. So basically, again, the cloning is just following the same manual steps or automatic steps that we had because in on-prem we, we had this in, a, in an automatic way. So basically what, what we did with this is, okay, let's transfer those steps to AWS but using AWS services, native services. So the way that we did this is also, again, using a state machine and state functions. So on this account that you see in the middle here, this is the, the one that is used to orchestrate, orchestrate all the process. So basically what it does is going to the production account, it's going to take a snapshot of the database in the production account. It's going to transfer that snapshot to the target account. In the target account, it's going to create volumes from that snapshot and it's going to mount those volumes in the target account. So in this process, it's gonna shoot down the database in the target account, it's gonna detach the, the volumes that need to be detached, it's gonna mount the new volumes, and at that point, we have the database in the target account. But it's an exact copy of production, so we need to run some steps to make that database the target database. So we need to change the name of the database, we need to run auto config on the DB tier, we need to change the passwords in the target, target database. So all those steps are done via scripts and those are called via 
the state machine. So the state machine <coughs> is going to call lambda functions, is going to call state functions, and those are going to perform those tasks. So those are called to scripts or to AWS services, native services. So in this process, no password is safe in any script. So all the passwords are safe in a parameter store. So all the, all the information is, is safe. When you need to make a password change, you only need to go to the parameter store and make the password change. So at the end of this process, you have your database clone. One of the things that we found doing this this way is when you finish with the database, the way that we were doing on-prem, the database on-prem was as fast as the source. When we are in AWS, the database is not as fast because the way that AWS created a volume from a state bucket, I'm talking from a snapshot, it will create the volume very fast from the snapshot, but the volume is not fully initialized, which means that the first time that you want to run a process there, the information is not there, which means that the users complain that, oh, my process is not there. It's, it's, the, 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 it's taking more time than it used to take. So that's something that we know it was going to happen because AWS has something called lazy loading, which means when you create a volume for an, from a snapshot, the data is not there. So there are ways to fix that problem. One way is to use a different volume type, which expedite the process. So all this that you see here, we have it working, and we are very happy with that process. Okay. okay, what is the current status of our project? So right now we are 100% in AWS. We closed the last of our two data centers the second week of November. So we are 100% AWS. So our performance is much better. With, with the migration to AWS, our performance got an improvement of 20%. And we introduced more HA to our platform. So right now, our primary and standard databases are running on institutes that are exactly the same. So we can do switch over from the primary to the standby without any issues. As a matter of fact, we did a switch over from our primary to the standby the week before Thanksgiving. So right now we're running on our standby server and users saw nothing. So for them, it was transparent. And we are planning to keep running on that server until January when we switch back to the primary. Okay, what is next for us? So like Mike mentioned, what we did basically was a lift and shift. So we went from VMs in uh, on-prem to ec 2 in AWS. So we are not using AWS native services. So our plan is to migrate some of our databases to RDS. We are a single region deployment. So what trying to see if we need to deploy our platform or our infrastructure in multi-region. That's also next for us. The other thing that we have is we have a lot of applications that are running on WebLogic and that WebLogic is, use, is running on EC2. So what we need is to move those, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> move those from EC2 to containers. That's the next thing that we need to do. And the last is cost optimization. And for that, we need to introduce more automation. You can find more information about, about our case in these links that you see here. There is a nice blog about our journey, how we went to AWS with EBS. And thank you.